we're going to go over chapter eight of asking the right questions a guide to critical thinking this is all about evidence the evidence that you'll be looking at to prove or disprove certain things three types of evidence that the book discusses are personal observation research studies and analogies personal observation guys to us is normally a great thing to use right we often say well i'll believe it when i see it However, it's not necessarily reliable. Our eyes often play tricks on us. Um, observers don't give us pure observations. Uh, they're most consistent with our prior experience and background, and a lot of times they contain misinformation, stereotypes, and confused memories. Um, there may be other things going on that kind of pull our attention away from what we were supposed to be observing. Uh, we carry with us many preconceived stereotypes on many, many different things, and those often play into what we see. Our brain actually kind of takes what we see and meshes it with what we already quote-unquote know. Um, and sometimes, especially if we're relying on memories, the memories get confused and are not necessarily um, fresh and, and uh, pure. So research studies as evidence. Everybody always wants to say, well, research says. And we would think that research studies would be really great evidence, mainly because they use the scientific method. It's usually publicly verifiable data, meaning that um, people have looked over this, normally peers in the um, area of study. People who are professionals in the area of study have looked over and said, yeah, that, that's verifiable data. Um, they're normally controlled to reduce error. They'll have a group that is tested and a group that is not tested. They've, they've understood common errors um, that are made in research in that particular field, and they'll control things to reduce the amount of error. And they're normally very precise in their language. In other words, they're not using that connotative language um, to evoke emo emotions. They are trying to be extremely precise in their language so as not to skew anything one way or the other. However, there's lots of problems with research findings. Look at all these. It varies greatly in quality. Um, you may have high quality research and low quality research. It depends on who does it and how they do it. Research findings often contradict one another um, and they don't prove conclusions, they support them. Rarely, actually never, can you come to a conclusion uh, in a research report and say this is the truth. Researchers must always interpret the meaning of their findings, and all findings can be interpreted in more than one way. And that, guys, is where that human error comes in and our own biases may come in. Researchers have expectations, attitudes, values, and needs that bias the questions they ask, the way they conduct their research, and the way they interpret research findings. Speakers and writers often distort or, simply, or, or simplify research conclusions. Research varies in how artificial it is. Now, with that, I, that means um, sometimes you can't exactly replicate something. For instance, you can't exactly replicate something happening with humans because uh, there are lots of laws saying, well, you can't do this with humans and you can't do that with the humans during a research study. Like, you can't take a baby away from its family and raise it, you know, with, uh, you know, apes to see what happens. Um, you could do things that kind of mimic that within the law, so on and so forth. So when we say how artificial it is, how much is it like exactly how this would be if it were occurring naturally? Um, and that varies depending on what your research is. The need for financial gain, status, security, and other factors can affect research outcomes. Guys, this is probably one of the most important things. Realize that when um, people are doing research, they have to be funded. They're not pulling money out of their own pocket. As a matter of fact, most of them are being paid through their research grant. So whoever is giving them the money for the research grant, they're probably going to want to promote what those people want to happen or, they, or the findings that they would like to happen. Um, a lot of people will do it for universities. Some will do it for governmental agencies. Some will do it for um, companies or products or... Uh, just people with money to, to back up their research. So you've really got to most carefully research this. And this takes a lot of kind of digging around, um, Googling the name of the researchers, finding out other things about them, what kind of values and beliefs do they hold, who is funding this, 
find out what you can about them, so on and so forth. It is really, really, really intricate. Um, research is, is not as reliable as we think. So clues for evaluating research studies, look at all these. Are you getting exhausted yet, guys, realizing that, gosh, we can't look at anything simply. Everything has to be investigated. What is the quality of the source of the report? In other words, who, who made this report? Are, are, was it a, a quality person or group, so on and so forth? Are there other clues included in the communication suggesting the research was well done? This is a really important question. Um, I'll come back to that in just a minute. How recently was the research conducted? Are there any reasons to believe that the findings might have changed over time? That's really important. You don't want to pull up research from 20 years ago. It may be very different today. Have the study's findings been replicated by other studies? How selective has the communicator been in choosing studies? Is there any evidence of strong sense critical thinking? Um, by this, you would want them to say at the end, you know what, this is our finding. Uh, the research shows that we need further investigation. I trust research when they say that. It is showing this, however, um, especially if they say it is showing this, however, there are lots of research studies that say opposite. That's really important. Is there any reason for someone to have distorted the research? Are conditions in this research artificial and therefore distorted? How far can we generalize given the research sample? Are there any biases or distortions in the surveys, questionnaires, ratings, or other measurements that the researcher uses? And guys, also, it, has it been replicated? Has this research been replicated over and over again? If it's one research study and nobody else has done the study, we can't really trust that one. It needs to be replicated and see if it has the same results every time. Um, case in point, I had a, a, a colleague that I worked with who was very pro video games. And he shared with me a, um, a research study that went on and on and on about how research or, or how violent video, video games are not harmful and how video games are not addictive and so on and so forth. And he showed this to me and I found that very interesting because my son loves video games. And I'm like, wow, this, you know, this almost flies in the face of common sense. And he's like, well, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And I was like, okay. So I, I went home that evening and I researched and came up with study after study after study after study that said the opposite of what this research said. Then to look a little more closely into this research, I found that the man who wrote the research was a video game developer. So you can see all the biases that went into that. And the, um, of course, I didn't have a chance to read his methodology or anything like that because I wasn't given the research. So just a, a case in point to see how research can be very, very misleading. Generalizing from a research sample. Guys, when they take samples, especially when they are, um, well, in, in any case, when they take samples, they have to be studying enough of the sample, has to be large enough to really say, this is my conclusion. If we're going to study, say, the drinking habits of college students, we can't just survey 100 students. Um, really, most research says if you don't survey 1,000, you probably shouldn't even bother with it, and most would rather far more than 1,000. Also, the sample must possess as much breadth or diversity as, as the types of events about which the conclusions are being drawn. In other words, if we're going to study drinking habits of college students, we want to look at them from the different years they're in college, their ages, their sexes, their backgrounds, their ethnicities, their hometown. I mean, you could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about how big your sample must be. And once you see how much breadth and diversity you need, you start to realize, oh, I need a larger and larger sample group. The more random the sample, the better. In other words, you want to make sure that you're not accidentally targeting in on one group because um, that will definitely skew the data. You want it to be very random and pulling people from everywhere, but you also want to make sure that in that random sample you are hitting enough of the diversity that you need. So as you can see, a, a research sample is not an easy thing to gather. It's really important to look at that because failure to attend sufficiently to the limits of sampling leads to overgeneralizing research findings. Guys, a lot of data is skewed because they manipulate this to pick out people or, or whatever research sample, they will pick out what they want knowing that it will give most likely a certain um, end result. Thus, they are skewing the data from the beginning. Bias surveys and questionnaires. Surveys and questionnaires are usually used to measure people's behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs. Um, first problem, they need to be answered honestly. Sometimes people aren't going to answer them honestly. Um, they're too busy. They don't want to deal with it. 
sometimes the person standing in front of them may seem um, threatening to them, so they don't want to answer a certain way. Or some their friends are with them, they don't want to answer a certain way if someone's looking over their shoulder. So you want to make sure that it's created so that they can answer it honestly. Um, questions are ambiguous in their wording. In other words, it's, uh, they're asking something, but they're asking it in a way that causes you to answer probably the way you wouldn't. Um, I've been part of those questionnaires before. Uh, and you, if you don't realize what they're doing, you very quickly answer wrong. At the opposite of what you actually believe, you answer that. But they use it for their data to say, look, most people say this. Um, they, be careful that it doesn't contain built-in biases in the context or the wording. Um, for instance, they may say, uh, you know, notice the, the horrible idea of so-and-so. Do you agree or disagree with it? Well, gosh, you're going to almost feel like, well, it's horrible. I, I should disagree with it. And then, of course, the length of it. If it gets too lengthy, people tend to start answering much more quickly toward the end. And then you don't, you don't get that honest answer. Um, so watch the length of them as well. And these are all things you can be looking for when you read research studies to say, huh, this might be skewed a bit. Analogies is evidence. Because analogical reasoning is so common and has the potential to be both persuasive and faulty, you will find it very useful to recognize such reasoning and know how to systematically evaluate it. To evaluate the quality of an analogy, you need to focus on two factors. One, the ways the two things being compared are similar and different, and to the relevance of the similarities and differences. Now these are the kind of analogies we're used to. Socks are to feet as gloves are to what? And you know that would be hands. Well, that's cute and fun and easy. However, when analogies are used as evidence, they're normally um, very, very faulty. They're very, very, uh, they're actually created to give you a very um, one-sided view of things. So watch when they use analogies. They're normally really poor evidence. Using evidence in your own writing, if you use this in your own writing, you'll learn to look for this in other writing, in others' writing. Observe and record consistently. So there has to be constant observation and careful recording of it. Carefully decide on a methodology. Guys, when you read research studies, read the methodology. That's the most important part because this explains exactly how they went about it. They talk about their sampling size, how many, um, how they did their experiment, because in that methodology is where a lot of the, the outcome can be skewed based on how they did it. What is the method that they went about to do this research? Keep accurate records and available records. Um, make sure that they're available to everybody. If those records aren't available, hmm, you want to start thinking, I don't trust this. Readers should be able to look over your findings. Put them out there. Guys, if your findings are reliable and 100% and on, uh, on the up and up, then everybody should be able to locate them, read them, look over them, and even uh, evaluate them. Keep in mind the limitations of your findings. Again, if the research comes to a conclusion and says, hey, this is a conclusion we came to and this is how it is, then be very leery. As we said from the very beginning, the research may support ideas, but as always, it's never uh, the, the, the end or the final say in, in anything. So keep all those in mind, guys. Um, finally, we've got the internet, right? And the internet's wonderful because there's so much information out there, and it's so easy to get a hold of. The importance of investigating a source's credibility is even greater when we add internet sources to the equation. Guys, sites may not be what they seem. There are actually sites created that seem like major corporations' sites. They'll even set those sites up to bring people in and people put their, their account numbers and so on and so forth, and they look so authentic that people put all their information in there and bam, they, they uh, are stolen from out of their accounts, so on and so forth. Um, so keep that in mind if it's so easy to make a site that looks like Bank of America, think how easy it is to make a site that looks like some sort of scientific site. Um, carefully consider and investigate anything you see on the internet. Usually a really safe bet is to stay on those um, sites from, mainly guys from, from libraries of, of universities. We have a great library, it has a lot of information in it. Sometimes the .gov are great, sometimes .gov internet sources are still highly biased. Um, same way with the .edu. A lot of times those are good, but a lot of times they are highly biased. That .org normally is, is going to be more of a um, obvious bias to it because those are normally things like blogs and that sort of thing. All right, guys. 
please be careful when you're doing that research don't trust everything you see as a matter of fact as critical thinkers you're probably getting to the point where you're thinking wow I don't think I can trust anything I see but once you get really adept at it you'll really start to be able to understand these things thanks guys bye